Hello, and we're going to have a presentation now on an introduction to code coverage. My name is Jason Masters. I'm a senior field applications engineer at Vector. So we're going to look at what is code coverage. We're going to define it, and then we're going to see why we need code coverage. Then we're going to look at the different sorts of coverage and see how much coverage is enough. And then when we think we've got all the coverage we need, is that still enough for our software? And then we'll have time at the end for some questions and answers. So what is code coverage? So code coverage is a measure used to describe how much code has been executed when a particular test suite runs. The idea is that a higher level of code coverage means that more code has been executed during testing and this suggests that there's a lower chance of undetected bugs making it through uh, compared to a program with lower coverage. The idea being that we don't want customers to be the first people to execute uh, code. We want to make sure we've executed all of the code during our testing. So code coverage is based on the flow of control achieved by execution of a test case for a piece of software. And this counts the number of code entities and relates this number to the total number of entities in the software. So if we think of this as a, a formula, the percentage of code coverage is the, the number of entities we've executed divided by the total number of those entities times 100%. And in this case, the entities are things that we can cover like statements, branches, conditions, functions, function calls, and uh, data and control couples. Um, we'll explain those shortly. So there's different categories of uh, coverage. At the lowest level, we can think of structural code coverage. So what code was executed during a function? So this is statement coverage, branch coverage, and MCDC coverage. Then at a, a wider scope, we have architectural code coverage. And this looks at the relationship between code entities. So things like function, function call, data, and control coupling. And as an analogy, uh, we can imagine doing software testing like proofreading a novel. So checking the grammar, punctuation, and spelling would be like static analysis. We can automate that, get a machine to do that for us. But making sure sentences and paragraphs make sense is like structural code coverage. And then making sure the story makes sense, the chapters are in the right order, the character names are consistent throughout the book, is like architectural coverage. And we'll come back to this analogy later. So why do we need code coverage? Well, it can help improve our software quality. Uh, as we've seen, the, the more code we have covered during testing, implies the less bugs there are in the code. It can also be used when we're outsourcing code development to subcontractors uh, to provide a level of acceptance that they must achieve a particular level of code coverage to prove they've tested the code. Also, adherence to industry standards. Uh, it's one of the things that's mandated in the regulations for uh, safety critical industries, avionics, industrial, medical, automotive, and rail, uh, and these mandate you must have levels of code coverage and prove you have covered it with a, a report that proves how much code coverage you have. And, and furthermore, for most of these, you have to use some particular system that is uh, uh, approved that uh, you use for gathering the code coverage to make sure that um, the code coverage hasn't been gathered in, in error. So if we look at the different certifications, the the higher the uh, safety integrity level, or, or DAL, or ACIL, or class, mandates higher levels of coverage. So at the lowest level, statement coverage is mandated, up to the highest level where MCDC is uh, mandated. And we'll go over these terms shortly. The, the basic idea is that as the safety integrity level increases, the amount of code coverage and the type of code coverage increases, and this tends to follow from a, a low software quality to a high software quality. So how much code coverage is enough? So we need to look at the sorts of different sorts of code coverage. So at the bottom, statement coverage. And this determines if each statement has been executed at least once. So we've got three statements here, an if condition uh, and some function calls. 
And if we get 100% statement coverage of these three calls, is our code fully tested? Well, no. Even if we get 100% coverage, bugs can still be present. What happens if we didn't call the normalize? We went down the implicit false of the if. If the code later on relies on us calling normalize, then our code won't work if we don't call normalize. So even 100% statement coverage might not, doesn't indicate that we've tested all the code. But we can say that it's better than 80% statement coverage, but even 100% doesn't reveal those uh, implicit code paths. So statement coverage isn't sufficient for projects with high safety integrity levels. It can help us reveal dead code, and if we don't get 100%, it can indicate there are perhaps missing test cases, so it is still useful. So next we have branch coverage, and this determines if each branch point has taken each possible outcome at least once. <clears throat> so for an if, have we gone down the true and the false path? And then other conditions like switches, where we can have multiple decisions, and ternary operators, which are kind of like compact if statements. So branch coverage measures the execution path, so is uh, more valuable than statement coverage. So it's kind of preferred over statement coverage. And within a function, if you have 100% branch coverage, this implies you have 100% statement coverage. The only problem with branch coverage is that it's insensitive to the structure of the decision. In C and C++, conditions can be short-circuited if they have no effect on the overall outcome. So, for example, if we have a look at the uh, condition here, we could go down the true path here without ever evaluating D, because we can short-circuit the evaluation of C and D um, depending on uh, the previous uh, conditions. So this can be a problem. We can get down the true path without ever evaluating condition D. And condition D could be something that causes the code to crash. So this uh, shortcoming is, is remedied by uh, condition coverage. So MCDC, uh, or Modified Condition Decision Coverage, can be thought of as branch coverage plus, or super branch coverage. And it ensures that each component of a condition can independently affect the outcome. So we have to make sure that we check all of the subconditions. Uh, we need to check them for both true and false. Um, and as you can see, the number of conditions grows uh, exponentially here. So we have two to the n. And for uh, the four cases here, we have 16 uh, different combinations. And, and the static analysis can tell you the truth tables for this. But in actual fact, for MCDC testing, we don't need to execute all of the combinations uh, to cover the uh, conditions correctly. What we do need to do is to execute each subcondition with true and false, while we hold all of the other subconditions the constant so that they don't change. And when we change one condition between true and false, we need to verify that the outcome of the entire condition changes as well. So once we've done that, this will tell us that each subcondition can independently affect the outcome, while all the other conditions are constant. It also tells us that all parts of code have been executed, all of the subconditions have been executed. It also tells us there's no logical contradictions in the conditions. So MCDC coverage gives us 100% branch coverage, and therefore that implies 100% statement coverage. And this is why MCDC is mandated for the highest safety integrity levels across all of the industrial standards. So you might think if you've got 100% MCDC coverage, you're done. I've got all the coverage I need. Well, no. Your functions have been covered, so we've kind of done the, uh, the proofreading of the paragraphs, but there's no evidence that the right functions were called in the right order for a particular uh, functional test. So we can move on to other categories of coverage. So function coverage indicates whether or not a function in the code is being called. And this is just like a Boolean, uh, whether the function has been called or not. So either it's either 100% or 0%. And so we can see that if we call function one, that one's covered. But in here, we might not call function two. We also have function call coverage to identify all the calls that can be made from a function and whether those calls have been tested. So have we called function two and function three from function one? These uh, function calls are shown at any level. 
And with C++, this can be uh, uh, quite uh, confusing because we have internal calls to private members, implicit calls to constructors, and so we can end up with a lot of uh, calls. And it can sometimes be hard to see the architecture from these calls. And it doesn't tell us anything about any data that was accessed between um, functions. When we do run a test with function coverage, we then need to verify that the correct functions were called uh, as per the design. So a particular input should cause a particular set of functions to be called. And we can use function call and function uh, call coverage to determine that. One of the advantages of this uh, type of uh, coverage is that however we gather the instrument, uh, the coverage, any instrumentation we use uh, in the code will be very light, so it won't impede the normal program flow. The next coverage is data and control coupling, and this is detected between components, where a component is something that's defined by the tester or the designer. It should match the architectural components. And a control couple is a function call from one component to another. And data couples are reading and writing data that's shared between components. And, and the idea is to prove the data and control flow matches the architectural design uh, and prove those flows have been tested. So for data couples, the idea is to capture the order of access to each couple to make sure we uh, write data before we read it. And for control couples to make sure that the correct functions are called uh, when we call those control couples. Uh, and this is uh, mandatory for uh, safety critical avionics software, but also fills objectives from ASPICE and ISO 26262. And once you have the coverage from data control coupling, you need to compare it with your architecture and your design to make sure that the actual implementation of the code matches the design. So if we think of having two components with some relationships between the components, we have data reads where we read data, we have data writes where we read and write data, and control couplings where we call functions between components. And these uh, relationships should match up with our design for these components. So how much coverage is enough? Well, generally 100% is what we're aiming for, but it's not always possible to achieve that, especially during system testing. It could be hard to reach error conditions. For example, uh, if you're checking for memory errors, it's quite hard to produce memory errors on demand. We may also have defensive code that's been mandated by a coding standard. You can combine coverage from different testing stages. So you can do your functional tests and get a degree of code coverage and then drop into unit testing and fill in the remaining gaps. It's usually easier to reach error conditions in the unit testing level as you have more control over inputs. Um, and that will give you 100%. You may also need to do some manual inspection to verify any defensive code is safe if you can't reach that code normally. So we've got 100% for all our coverage, structural and architectural, we're done, right? Well, not quite. If we go back to our proofreading a novel, we may have checked the spelling, the grammar, and the story makes sense. But if the story we've got is a Victorian romance and we wanted a modern day crime novel, then we've completely failed. However good your coverage is, if it's not related to the requirements, then it is of limited value. Uh, and we can show this by having a, uh, most tools can generate test cases to traverse the paths in a function and generate input values to go down these paths. And some can also set expected values based on the code behavior. But what does this tell us? Well, it tells us we have a tool that can do that proves the code didn't crash for those particular input values. It shows us our compiler works because the code does what the code says and not much else. So code coverage it, for code coverage's sake on its own is of limited value. It really has to be related to the requirements of the code. If the inputs and expected values are derived from the requirements, then the coverage means something. The code is doing what it is supposed to be doing. We can also then think about requirements coverage. Have we got a test for each requirement? Can we prove the traceability between the requirements, test cases, and code coverage? And this provides visibility to make sure requirements are being tested and that the code fulfills the requirements. And this also satisfies a number of the traceability requirements in the regulated industry standards. 
So if we go for 100% requirements coverage as well, we're done, yeah? Well, not quite. Uh, code coverage tells us what code has been tested, um, but uh, so we can point out dead code and insufficient test cases, but we can't detect emissions like missing or complete incomplete code. And that's where the requirements coverage can help. If we don't have 100% requirements coverage, then we still may have 100% code coverage, but that mismatch will tell us that we need to write some more code to handle some of the requirements we haven't implemented. And the value of the code coverage derives not just from the executed code, but also from the test case intent. Was the expected code executed for each test case, both at the expected values and the flow control? We can also measure the code coverage across the life cycle of our, our project. And this can give us a, a health indication of our project as we're progressing. If we have a, a set of code and the percentage of the coverage increases, this could mean that the uh, testing is catching up with development. On the other hand, if the percentage of code coverage decreases, it could mean that people are adding new code without testing it. A report can show whether the application you're releasing is fully tested, and these reports are typically required by the safety standards. And monitoring the coverage across the life cycle could help developers focus on software quality, testing the code as they write it, building the quality into the code as they write the code.